I don't know about you, but I rejoice as we stand on the threshold in the doorway of a new year for 2021. Whenever you think about last year, I dare say most people have negative thoughts about what went on last year. That's sort of our tendency. We tend to focus on the negative things. I'm reminded of a school teacher who came into her schoolroom and she began to write upon a board. It must have not been recently because they don't let them even come into schoolrooms anymore. But she was writing on the, the board and she wrote, one time nine equals seven. Two time nine equals 18. Three time nine is 27. Four time nine is 36. Five time nine is 45. Six time nine is 54. Seven times nine is 63. Eight times nine is 72. Nine times nine is 81. And then 10 times nine is 90. And as she finished writing the, those equations on the board, she began to hear some sniggering and laughing and, and whispering behind her. And so she turned around and she addressed the students and she said something like this. She said, you know, I wrote that first equation wrong for a purpose. And she said the purpose was is that even though I did it right nine times, you focused on the one negative. I don't want us to be like that, focusing on the negative. How much do we have to be thankful for in 2020? When you think back over 2020, what God did, how that the debt was erased by God's grace, when you think about the friends that you got to meet because of the pandemic that you would not have met otherwise, when you think about how that God allowed us to minister during that period of time, and then I remember the baptisms that took place in 2020. The waters of baptism were stirred. We have so much to be thankful for. And so when I say that I'm looking forward to 2021, I rejoice because I can't wait to see what God is going to do in 2021. And that's the way we ought to be when we think about stepping through the doorway of a new year. But you know, there's a, another doorway that, that we need to talk about that's going to help you make sure that your 2021 is really a happy new year. This doorway we're going to talk about this morning is a doorway that will make sure that you can become new and that you will be happy. And that doorway is described in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 through 29. So if you got your Bibles, open them up to Matthew's gospel, chapter 7 and verses 13 through 29. And as you're finding your place, I always tell you the same thing. If you ever listen to my sermons, they're always going to say this. You need to know what the book is about before you dive into the text. And so whenever you talk about the gospels, the four gospels, you know, Warren Wiersbe did a wonderful job with that, and he basically calls them biographies of, of Christ. I like to think of them as paintings, to borrow from him. Uh, you know, I think of paintings, each of being a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he just used different paintbrushes. You know, with John, he used the paintbrush to picture Christ as the Son of God. In Luke, he used him as a paintbrush to paint Christ as the son of man. And in Mark, he used Mark to paint Jesus as the suffering servant. But in Matthew, he uses Matthew to paint Jesus as the king of kings. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today because all of this letter, or excuse me, of this gospel is about us honoring Jesus Christ as who he is, and that is the king of kings. And if there's one thing that this sermon is going to be all about so that you don't miss it and go out and not know what it is, it's about honoring Jesus Christ as king because that's what the book is all about. Now, in order to make sure that we honored him in the right way and understood that he's worthy of our honor, what Matthew begins to do from the very beginning is lay the foundation to prove that he is indeed the king of kings. He starts in chapters 1 and 2, and he describes for us the scriptural lineage of a king. 
He says, I can prove to you that Jesus is the king, the scriptural lineage in chapters one and two. Then in chapters three and four, he shows his sovereign authority. If you go through three and four, what you're gonna see is that he commands the waves. He is all powerful. He is the sovereign one. And then as he comes to chapters five through seven, he pictures him as the king because he's one who speaks with authority in his sermon on the mount. So what we're doing at this very point is that we're looking at how that Matthew honors Jesus as king because we want to honor him as, as such. And if we're to do so, we need to look at this sermon on the mount. Now, it is a sermon. And what we're doing is we're getting in right on the conclusion of it. Some of you like that. You said, boy, I wish I could get in on the conclusion of most of those. Skip out the body, just get to the conclusion. Well, we're going to slip into this service on the mountain that Jesus is preaching. And what we're doing is we're basically coming in on his conclusion, his invitation. And in that, we can say that it's important for us to go back and say, well, what, what has he already preached previously? Well, if you want to talk about what he's already preached, he, he basically, Jesus, proclaimed, bless those who honor him in their character. Chapter 5 and verses 1 through 12. If you're taking notes in his sermon, you might have missed it. It'd be like some of you slipping in today, and you got in a little late, and you lean over to a friend, and you say, well, what has he already said? Well, what he's already said is this. Blessed are those who honor him in their character, 5, 1 through 12. Then he says, blessed are those who honor him in their community, in chapter 5 and verses 13 through 16. And then from verse 17 all the way through verse 48, he says those who honor him in his creed are blessed. You know how he ended verse 48 in chapter 5? He said, you are to be what? Perfect. As your heavenly father is perfect. You know, I'm amazed at how often what we do with Jesus, is, his standard is, is that we tend to want to lower it. <laughs> that perfect idea doesn't fit very well with our lifestyle. But he says, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's what he's already said. Another thing that he's emphasized is, blessed are those who honor him in their conduct. He talks about that from Matthew 6 through chapter 7 and verse 12. So those are his points. He's had one, two, three, four points already. And now he's coming to a final point. Those who honor him in the conclusion. And that's what we're going to be talking about in Matthew chapter 5, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 through 29. So please stand for the reading of God's word as we read Jesus' invitation. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, and the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce Good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you'll know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you, we ask, Lord, that you would grant grace and mercy during these services of worship. Lord, as the word, your word goes forth, we're encouraged to know that it will not return void. So, Father, we're excited to see what's going to happen this morning. 
Father, my heart's desire and prayer is that, that those within the sound of my voice and those listening, whether live stream or whatever measure, might enter by the narrow gate and enter into the king's highway and truly be made new and have a happy new year. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. C.S. Lewis wrote, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done, or those to whom God says, thy will be done. We're going to be looking to see whether or not we're on the narrow way or the broad way. And many of you probably already are thinking of checking out because of the fact that you're saying, this is an evangelistic message and I'm good. Well, that may be so. I hope this message confirms to you exactly what you're thinking so that you can go out rejoicing. But remember, the greatest deception is self-deception. And so I want you to listen carefully at what Jesus says. I I was telling uh, Brother Matt, I said I probably wouldn't do this, but I was telling Brother Matt, I'm I'm a good mind to tell you that I'm going to plagiarize a sermon. Because that's exactly what I'm going to be doing is talking based upon the authority of what Jesus said was necessary in entering on the king's highway. And if whatever we have in our minds doesn't line up with what Jesus said, I can tell you, on the authority of God's word, you'll be wrong. You're on the broad way, not the narrow way if you don't line up. And so what I want to encourage you to do is listen carefully as he outlines for us very simply how you can know whether or not you're on the king's highway. And if you look at this text, it breaks down so easily. In verses 13 and 14, he talks about the commitment that is necessary to enter onto the king's highway and honor him. The commitment that is necessary. And then in verse 15, he's going to describe to you the cautions that are necessary for those who would desire to enter on the king's highway. So that's all he's going to do. Jesus, as he comes to the conclusion of his message, basically said, let me lay it out plain and clear. What is necessary? What commitment is necessary to enter on the king's highway? Look at it there in verses 13 and 14. He says, enter through the narrow gate. And that's pretty self-evident. But, you know, when we think of things metaphorically, it's hard for us to, you know, if there's maybe a gate here or, a you know, a broad gate over there, we would be able to look at it and see where it was. Well, there's some things about this gate we need to, to take in mind because, first of all, if he calls it a narrow gate, since it's narrow, that means that it's calling for a radical commitment. The word stenos, which is used for narrow here, basically has the idea of constricting. And so this is not something that is easily done. In fact, when you talk about it in Luke, it says strive to enter in. It's It's a radical commitment that he's calling for here. And you say, well, what kind of radical commitment is it? Well, if we look at this, we could look at various places where the word narrow is used, and I could take you to some of those, but I'm just going to refer to one verse for time's sake today. Matthew 19, 24, a little bit later on, here's what Jesus said. Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That's pretty narrow, isn't it? That's pretty radical. Don't be fooled. It is a radical commitment that you must make to enter on the king's highway. And if you've not made that radical commitment, you're not on it. 
You say, well, what, what does it tell us about it? We'll look at enter. The word enter is very interesting. The word that is used here is es erkomai. Now, some of you will be saying, you know, why do you talk about Greek terms? Because of the fact that it's a compound verb. It, it includes a preposition and a verb. Ice or ace means into. Erkomai means to come or to go. What he's telling you is that you don't just partially go in. You completely go in. It's a total commitment. And if you look at Scripture elsewhere, you see that same emphasis when it talks about uh, Noah, for example. It uses in the um, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 38 this same word. Noah entered the ark. Did he halfway go in or halfway get out? No. He was all the way in. It takes a total complete commitment to enter on the king's highway and honor him. Now, I don't know how many of you remember the old skating rink here in Muscle Shoals. It was behind Pasquale's. Anybody remember the Kirklands, I think, not only owned it, but ran that skating rink? How many of you remember? Can I see a show of hands? I know it, it sort of ages you or puts a number on you, but it was behind Pasquale's. And, and you know, one of the things that I, I remember about that skating ring was this, that if you came up and you didn't have some parent that was there with you to vouch for you, you didn't get in. There were some strict regulations to get in. You know what else? Now, y'all tell me if I'm wrong and I'm lying here. If your hair came down over your ears, did you get in? If it touched the back of your collar, did you get in? Come on. No. I'm thankful. Boy, it was a family atmosphere. It was strict. You know, some of us think that, that the commitment that Christ calls for is one of the things that happened at the skating rink. Would y'all remember one of the things you always did was the hokey pokey? Come on. Don't act like it. Like you don't know what I'm talking about. You've you never done it before. A lot of people think about a hokey pokey commitment to Christ and a hokey pokey Christianity because they, they certainly believe it because they put the right arm in and then they take the right arm out. They put the right arm in. I could go on. You, you keep looking at me and I'll go on with it. You know how it goes. A shaky commitment. A lot of people think that's the way God is with us. That he's, he's expecting we just give him a little bit and pull it out. A little bit, pull it out, shake it a little bit. He's not talking about a hokey pokey commitment here, a hokey pokey Christianity, when he talks about total commitment. And we know that from, from the gospel itself. He tries to tell you, and listen to me. It's funny, but it's not. Because what he goes on to tell us in gospel message after gospel message is this, that it is always a total commitment and only a total commitment that get you on the king's highway. That is a part of that word enter. In Mark 10, 17 through 22, you'll know the story of the rich young ruler, the good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, he talks him about the commandments and he said, I've kept them from my youth up. And, and then Jesus looking at him felt love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. You know what's amazing to me how that believers and so-called believers look at that passage of Scripture and they immediately discount the commitment that Jesus required there. They said, you have to understand theologically and contextually that was for the rich young ruler. Can I be so bold as to say no? It is for you and me as well. If you're hanging on to anything, if it's riches, if it's 
the fountain of youth. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is you're hanging on to, you won't commit, you're holding back, you're not entering in. Jesus just put his finger on the particular situation, but all of us have to be saying the same thing. I'm willing to commit everything. My house, my car, my money, my everything. What else does he tell us? In Matthew 10, 37, 38, he says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. You know what amazes me about that text? If you look at commentary after commentary, they try to describe, you know what he's really saying here is. No, what he's really saying there is, it doesn't make any difference whether it's your father, your mother, your daughter, your sister, your brother. If you're not willing to give everything to me and your full devotion above them to me, you're not worthy. Now, folks, that's called total commitment. And it's easy to talk about that, but what is the truth about that? Has he got first place in our heart? And then he goes on further. In Luke 9, 23 and 24, you know the passage well. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow after me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one who will be saved. Now, it goes even deeper. That's pretty much a total commitment. Everything you got everything you own, Christ first in your heart above those nearest and dearest to you, and then what else? Yes, your life. When he uses the word enter into, he's saying totally. It is not a partial commitment. What else does he teach us here about this entering? The word is a, a verb, and it's in the second person. He says, you enter. It's a personal pronoun, you, emphasizing that you individually must do this. It's not something anybody else can do for you. When you think about this narrow gate, it's like a portal or a turnstile that admits one person at a time. You don't get in on your ancestors or those near and dear to you. In Matthew 3, 9, prior to this sermon, John the Baptist rebuked the Pharisees and Sadducees, saying, do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. What were they saying? Hey, because of our ethnicity, and we're the Jews, that we're going to get in. He said, no, 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 no. You don't get in like a group. You get in individually, one by one. And you say, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Well, let me, let me emblazon this on your mind. In Matthew 7, 24 and 25, a little bit later on in our text, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew, slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Hey, that's good news. Do you know the word everyone there is in the singular? He's emphasizing each one must do this. We see it again in Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone, singular. Romans 10.13, whoever, singular, will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Galatians 2.16, 2 Corinthians 5.10, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. All of them say the same thing. It's singular. Each one of you individually, personally, have to make that decision. And if there's one thing I could say to you, I feel what Paul felt in Romans 9, 1 through 3 when he said, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I was accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my loved one. But you know what? Paul couldn't pray for them. 
He couldn't believe in his heart for them. He couldn't do it for them. And I don't care what anybody else tells you. If they tell you, hey, just repeat after me. If it's not your words, they're worthless. If it's not from your heart, it's worthless. This commitment is radical. It involves a total commitment, and it is a personal commitment. No one else can do it for you. I'm telling you, there are parents, and there are others who right now have grief in their heart for a lost loved one, and you wish, Lord, I would would rather be accursed as to know that they're not saved. You know what I'm talking about, and you know what Paul's talking about. But listen to me, loved one. They can't do it for you. I can't do it for you. There's going to be an invitation at the end of this service. And the only person who can do anything about that is you. And you're not responding to Brother Tim. You're not responding to what somebody else is saying. You're responding to a message that Jesus preached. And what he tells you is, those who enter on the king's highway, they come with a total commitment, and it's a personal commitment. Will you personally submit your life to Christ today? Notice something else here. The verb enter is in the aorist. You're saying, I I hate when you deal with Greek. Well, he wrote it that way. And the heir's tense carries with it the idea of an immediate, decisive action. You know what that means? The command is not to ponder the gate, but act decisively now, at once. It restricts partially committing. It restricts the person's committing and it restricts the period of which you can commit. You don't believe me? Proverbs 27, 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. I know what you're thinking. Because I thought it before, before I put my faith and trust in Christ. I'll I'll wait. Because I'm young. The Bible says, do not boast about tomorrow. You don't know. John Charles Ryle wrote, your time is short. Your days are but a span. This is what the Bible says. A shadow, a vapor, a tale that is soon told. Your health may be taken from you in a moment. It only needs a little fall, a fever, a little inflammation, a blood vessel that breaks in your brain. and you're dead. And you say, well, when you see the Lord, well, I meant to, it's not going to mean anything at that point in time. Because I'm going to tell you, we already know that because what did the, the rich man say in hell when he lifted up his eyes in hell? He began to think that, hey, maybe he could negotiate this thing and get out. There's no negotiating at that point. What about those virgins that when the the master got up and shut the door and they said, well, you know what? Hey, 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 we're here now. No. You don't come when you're ready to come. You come when the Holy Spirit moves you. And when he moves, Jesus is telling you here, you better respond now. 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 Not in a minute. Do not presume that you're going to be alive tomorrow. I read in the, on Fox News where that there was this family that was just in California and they'd just gone out on the beach enjoying a day out on the beach and they had two young children. One, one I think was six and I can't remember the age of the other, but very young. The mother was there, the daddy was there. 
they were enjoying their time on the beach, got out in the waves a little bit. I know because I went to California and I was standing in uh, Carmel, California, where, um, goodness, you know what happens when you get old, go brain dead. Clint Eastwood, thank you, was the mayor at one time. I was standing on the beach there and looking at those beautiful waves that were coming in, and they said, won't you take a picture and do this, that, and the other? And I, I said, okay, and I got over here and I was doing this. The next thing I know, a wave hit me about right here. I'm in fully clothed. And I'm telling you, it, was, it about knocked me down. Well, it happened to that family. The two little kids were standing there when that wave came in. It hit, and it took them back out. Well, the daddy jumped back in and went after him, clawing, trying to get a hold of the child, got a hold of the little boy. But the news article goes on to say, the dad drowned and the two kids drowned, and the mother was left on shore crying. You don't know. Leaving out of the parking lot here, you're driving, somebody crosses the center line, you say, you're trying to scare us. Yes. Knowing the fear of the Lord. You want me to quote scripture for you? We persuade. You have a reason to be afraid because the wrath of God is upon you if you've not put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's just by his gracious mercy that he doesn't remove it. Hebrews 4, 7, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And why am I quoting that verse? To remind you this, I know what you're thinking. Well, hey, I'm not going to make a commitment, but you know what? I will soon. He says each time you say no to the Holy Spirit, you know what happens? Heart gets a little harder. Hebrews 3, 13 confirms it. But encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Is it a sin to deny the command of God? He's commanding you. This is an aorist imperative. He is commanding you today to put your faith and trust in him. And every day you don't, you're a little bit harder. And it gets a little bit harder. I know what people think. They think, you know, one day I will. Spurgeon had a person who attended his church like that who died, and this is what Spurgeon said. There was no place left for him for repentance, he had wasted the opportunity. Therefore, I pray and beseech you, my dear hearers, by the near approach of death, it may be much nearer than you think. Give earnest heed to these things. I look around, he said, in this building, and I note the pews and sittings from which hearers whose faces were once familiar to us have gone. Some to glory, some I know not where, but God knows Oh, let not the next removal be, if it be yours, vacate the, skeef, uh, the seat of a scoffer or of a neglector or of one who, having been touched in his conscience, silenced the secret monitor and would not turn. As the Lord liveth, you must turn, and that people in this day and time don't like this, or burn. You must either repent or be ruined. May God give you the wisdom to choose the better part. In 2020, you could look around this audience, this congregation, and you can point out places where people sat who are no longer with us. Death is sure. Don't fool yourself that you're not going to die. You are and I am. How can you drive by cemetery after cemetery on your way to places and not see the yawning mouth of death with its teeth puncturing through the earth as those tombstones stick through? It 
It's a radical commitment. It restricts the period in which you can commit. You don't come when you're ready. You come when he calls. And there is a time when you've stiffened and hardened your neck. You no longer even hear the call. It also restricts one other aspect, the passageway. Notice it says, enter through the definite article, the narrow gate, and the gate is singular. There's only one way. Only one way. That's what he's emphasizing by the the and the singular gate. There's not many gates. It's not a gate. There's only one gate. The radical commitment restricts the passageway. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which you must be saved. Acts 10, 42 and 43, and he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this, the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone, singular, who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And I could go on and on and on quoting scripture. There's only one door, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I beseech you, by the mercies of God, enter through the narrow gate. Enter through Christ. I could preach for an hour and a half. But let me just say this to you. One of the things I teach, I see some of my students who've been in pastoral training institute, I teach them about concluding a message. You got to set forth the, the principle, the clarification. Then you got to exhort. And somebody said, where do you get that? You have to exhort people. What does Jesus do next? This is how much he cares about you. He not only gives the command, the commitment that's necessary, he starts reasoning with you. Listen to his reasoning. Now, granted, once again, if I get off track here, you can rebuke me later, but I'm just going to reason the way he reasons. He says here in this text, Enter through the narrow gate. Now, notice the word for. He's going to give a reason. The gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And a way to just cut to the chase here is this. I know, and he uses two different words. It's amazing to me, the scriptures. He uses two different words for um, the aspect of what, is he, what order does he use it in here. He says, uh, the way is broad, um, excuse me, the gate is wide and the way is broad. He uses two different words. And I thought to myself, why does he use two different words? Because it, it, it goes right against, it's in contrast to what he just said, enter by the narrow. What does narrow mean? Constrict. There are restrictions. What about the broad way? No restrictions. No restrictions. That's why you like it. No restrictions. Then, if you go back and look at what he says, he says, you know, the, the gate is narrow. He's going to say also that this is a broad way, and he uses a different term, and in that broadness, he's saying that you'll be unmolested on this road. So there'll be no restrictions. You'll be unmolested. People won't be harassing you because you're going the way of the world, see? You're going with the crowd. 
But he always comes back to this. But you're going to get destroyed. That's the clincher. Here's the way he's arguing with you. He gives a negative argument first, and then he's going to give a positive argument. His negative argument is this. You're right. No restrictions. Let loose with your flesh. No restrictions. Nobody's going to molest you. They're going to cheer you on. But you'll be destroyed. Unless you're thinking to yourself what everybody thinks about being destroyed, that's going to happen to everybody else. But you know, Dr. Seal, I'm going to get off before right at the last minute. See, I'm going to be driving down that road hard and fast, and then it's going to come to the last minute before the bridge is out, and I'm getting off this road. That's what everybody thinks. Do you know that the strong man keeps his goods at peace? The devil is about distracting you all the way. Oh, hey, hey, look over here, look over here. Right when you're thinking about doing something, he brings in a distraction. Right here in this service, right now, he's at work just like God's at work. And he's saying to you, you know what? You've got other things to be doing, places to be, food to be cooked. He uses all those different things to distract you so that you never make that decision until it's everlastingly too late. You're going to be destroyed. Well, good, I'll, I know I'll be annihilated. No. No, you won't. Well, I'm not afraid of death. Why? This funeral is a grave affair. You make jokes about it. Let's put the fun back in funeral, they say. The will is a dead giveaway. What are the ghost's favorite streets? They're dead ends. Ha, ha, ha. A rich man opened up his eyes in torment. And the Bible describes, and I don't have time to go through it all, the bottomless pit, the darkness, the fiery hell, the worm that does not die, no hope, torment, and then it says there will be no laughing matter. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chrysostom wrote, The damned shall suffer an end without an end, a death without a death, a decay without decay. They shall have punishment without pity, misery without mercy, sorrow without succor, crying without comfort, torment without ease. Now, God shoots with us straight. And you're going to say, well, you know what? Everybody else is doing it. That's why he says, and it's crowded. Many are on that way. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, everybody else is doing it? If all you can say is I'm doing these things because other people are doing them, you're in trouble. Then he gives the positive. He says, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And if you want to want to cut to the chase again, he basically says, here's my argument. If you go that other way, you're going to be destroyed. If you come this way, you're going to have life. Yes, at the very beginning, there are restrictions. There's only one way through me. You can't partially come. You got to totally commit. There's a period which, a period of grace. Now is the day. But you get life. You get life here. And what's it like? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. And you get life in the hereafter. What's it like? No more death. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more sin. No more sin. But you get to see Jesus. 
and to be with the King of Kings forever and ever and ever. Boy, I want to go home and preach the rest of it, but he's going to tell you there's people going to be standing at the doorway, the cautions telling you other things. Don't listen to them. He's going to tell you, don't make a false profession. Don't do a partial trusting in Christ. It's got to be all or nothing. Well, Brother Tim, how does that square with the sovereignty of God? It does, because when he does the work in you, you're going to want to do this. But if you don't want to do this, you have no hope. 